Well, I'm just uh, waiting to be called in on the Nor Norfolk Amateur Radio Society uh, TV show. This is Wednesday, and uh, they're talking now on the um, screen. And they're going to call me in in about Hello. five minutes. Hello and welcome to the Waters and Stanton video channel. Thank you for joining me. This is a slightly different video. I was recently asked by the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club if I would be guest on their TV show which they run every Wednesday. And of course I said yes, be, be happy to. Now the Norfolk um, Club is a very large one. It's about 170 odd members. So by amateur radio terms, that's a good club membership. And I uh, said, yes, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk or whatever. And it turned actually into an interview. And that interview turned into <laughs> sort of my, covering the 60 years of my ham radio operation, which is why I've entitled this um, uh, my first 60 years in ham radio. Actually, technically, that's not quite right. It's 61 years. But anyway, who's going to argue over a year? So what I've decided to do is to put some clips up of this uh, interview and I've divided the video into two sections because otherwise it would be quite long and I've actually given a few explanations uh, as the um, video goes through. And well it's really all about me and the last 60 years in amateur radio. Now what I would say before we start the video is that if you're not a member of an amateur radio club then it's worth considering because I think over the last year, uh, a lot of these clubs now have um, adapted so that they can operate using Zoom or whatever. And I think it's really highlighted the fact that you don't physically need to attend a radio club meeting to participate, which means to say more people can now join the club. So if you're interested in joining the club, and I would encourage you to consider it because you are then in contact with local hams following the same hobbies yourself. Click on the RSGB site and you'll see where the nearest club is to you. And it's worth following it through because um, if you're a member of a club, then of course you meet your fellow ham members in the uh, locality. And there's all sorts of bits of information that uh, pass around in clubs, things that perhaps you've never thought of before, little tips and tricks. So if you don't belong to an amateur radio club, give it some thought. But the Norfolk, uh, Norfolk Amateur Radio Club is a very large club and they operate a very well established and presented TV channel. So let's have a look. On tonight's show, our getting to know guest is Peter Waters, G3 OJV of Waters and Stanton fame. Every month we have a, a, a feature called Getting to Know where we get to know someone a little bit better who's been into, in the uh, amateur radio community. And our guest tonight is the Waters in the very well known amateur radio retailer Waters and Stanton. But as we'll learn tonight, Peter Waters isn't just a businessman, but a genuine, long-term, enthusiastic radio amateur. So it's really wonderful to welcome Peter from his home in Hockley in Essex. Good evening to Peter. Good evening and uh, welcome to Hockley, Essex. And uh, thanks for the introduction. Yes, uh, I have been around for quite a few years, actually. So it is very much long term, both business and, of course, the hobby. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing about everything about your life. And I know you're not just a radio amateur, you're a keen musician and everything as well. And we're going to learn all about that, aren't we, Peter? But maybe can we start by just finding out how you first got involved with amateur radio? I went into a news agent's uh, locally to me uh, when I was living in Hornchurch. And I came across a magazine called Shortwave Magazine. And I thought, Shortwave, that's radio. So I looked at this magazine, had a quick flick through it, and I thought, gosh, I, I saw a picture of a, a guy operating a radio station. I thought, what fun it would be to have your own radio station. So I bought this copy of Shortwave Magazine and took it home and read it from cover to cover. And that really was how I first became really aware uh, that amateur radio existed through mm. radio. We've got a picture of a book here that you sent us, Peter. I don't know if this where this quite fits in those early days, but we'll just show you this picture now. So is this the Radio Constructor? No, that was that's an RSGB publication. Um, and you, as you can see, I was a bit younger then. 
It was actually taken in 19... Oh, that's you on the front. I didn't know that. I'm that's sorry. That's on the front cover, yes. Right, okay. Yes, oh. uh, yes. Well, there you are. You see, I've aged so much, you don't recognise me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Victor G3JNB says, Hi, Peter. I've just taken my copy of A Guide to Amateur Radio from the bookcase, he says, and it gave me the lead into the hobby. So now we have this three-level of, of uh, exam entry but in those days there was just one wasn't there and it was a really like effectively like taking the full I guess but but not not multiple answers not multiple questions and things as well Peter that's what you're saying isn't it It was much tougher in other words to get into and to get your license for amateur radio yeah I suppose in, in a way it was tougher of course radio in those days was still being developed so uh, it was a lot of it was a bit more basic than what it would have been now uh, it was Vel, uh, how Vels operate, how an oscillator operates. Uh, you have to draw a block diagram of a, of a transmitter and this sort of thing. Uh, but it was, it was. I mean, it was te technical enough to uh, to um, warrant a city and guilds exam, which is what we did. Brilliant. So, what was next then? When did you finally get your shack? What, what do you remember when you were licensed? Yes, I can. Um, I previously built a two valve regenerative receiver, which. Uh, I found subsequently covered 40 metres. I heard radio amateurs. I had no idea where they were, but I found later it was the 40 metre amateur radio band. Um, I passed the uh, exam at the first sit-in, and then, of course, I had to do the CW, the Morse code. And again, I was self-taught. I used to listen to Morse code on the air, and there was practice transmissions locally by local amateurs. And I, went, I was working in London then. It's quite easy because I then uh, went to post office, as it was then, to take the uh, CW examination, 12 words a minute, pass that, got me tip, got my little um, bit of paper saying I passed the CW exam, and then I applied for my licence, and the application for my licence was on foot. I went down to the local post office headquarters in London. Um, I went into some room there, which I had to go to to, to apply for my licence. A lady bought um, an exercise book to the counter, all handwritten, and she said, you can have any one of those call signs on that page. Wow. I have no idea why I chose G3OJV, but I did. And that was how I got my call sign. I just went in there, and it was in, in a textbook, uh, an exercise book, rather, handwritten, and uh, that was it, G3OJV. The next question was, what was my first job before I started Waters and Stanton? <laughs> it's also going back a long time. Many, a lot of us will already know that you know, you eventually ended up running a shop. But so, can we ask though? In those days, you said you worked in London. What were you doing? What was your career in the early days? Right. Well, I I, I was I was in the insurance industry. I I, I, I trained as a fire insurance surveyor, um, and I was I was working in uh, insurance until I was thirty, and my patch was basically London. Um, and uh, parts of Essex. And my job really was to go around um, to look at the buildings, uh, to assess them from a fire risk point of view, um, check fire extinguishers, check um, the workings of sprinklers, because a lot of buildings had sprinklers, make sure they were operating okay. Came, came back, did drawings of the buildings, um, and that was then passed to the insurance underwriters who would then uh, calculate a, uh, a, a premium. Uh, this is all commercial, of course, uh, calculate mm. a premium for the risk. I was then asked, when did we start Waters and Stanton? Well, it was a long time ago. Roughly when was this? What sort of time? I'm, I apologise. It's very it. easy. It's a year that's very easy to remember. It was 1973, would you believe? 1973. We've got a picture here, I know, is, uh, of the shop. Can we show that right now? Yes, you can. That's, that, sh that picture was taken... Uh, around about 19, uh, that would have been about 1976, 78. And uh, that probably was our entire stock. But one of the other uh, pictures that you've sent us is, is not a picture uh, of something that we'd associate with you. Can we show that now, actually, Tammy, to put you on the spot? Um, this is a picture of you, not with no radio <laughs> in there, but you're playing the drums. So what is it? Love of music? Well, that was that has always been my other interest, music. Um, I, I actually, my, my, the, my main instrument was violin. I used to play the violin um, as a kid at school and then I got a scholarship and I studied music at Trinity College uh, uh, London until I was 18 and I studied the violin and also piano. I didn't like the piano really. Um, but I played the violin subsequently um, in a number of amateur orchestras. I was in the uh, Essex Youth Orchestra, 
um, which is a classic sort of symphony orchestra type thing, up to the age of about 20, I think. Um, but I, I, it, I was never a sort of professional stander, but I, I, did, I did enjoy it. And I, play, I carried on playing. I played in um, the pits of several um, theatres in Hornchurch when they had operas there and that sort of thing. Um, but then in later times, I started to develop an, an eye problem. It's, it's, it's just been a problem for the whole of my life, really, since the age of 18. And I've been a life member of Moorfields Eye Hospital. I think I've been going to Moorfields for about 60 years now. Wow. Um, and I eventually give up the violin because I just couldn't read the music. I had a, a particular um, eye problem where there's a little bit missing and I, therefore I couldn't read music. And I really gave it up. And then about 15 years ago, um, I remarried and Sue, my uh, my wife, is a very good keyboard player. And I said, I wish I could join in. And she said, what about drums? And I thought, gosh, I don't know. I'd, I'd never tried, tried playing drums. So I got in touch with a local drum teacher who happened to be a professional jazz drummer. And um, that's how I took up drums, and I, I play drums as and when I get the opportunity. Um, and the and the Graham, my music teacher, has become a sort of a, a lifelong friend now because we've got, both got another interest, which is aircraft. But that's another story. I won't <laughs> bore you with aircraft. No, well, that's all right. It's lovely to get to know you. Um, we've got another picture here. I don't want to. I, I hope we're, we're we're playing these about the right amount. We've got another picture here. Um, of this is a, a aircraft being handed over. I mean, do you want to talk about that at this point? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, um, I I have been going to Dayton in the states, the, the Hamvention there for years. I think I must have made about. I think I must have gone there for twenty five uh, trips without without a break. And of course, the break occurred with COVID a couple of years ago now, or a year or so ago. Um, but I've always uh, been quite friendly with um, Eric Schwartz, who's there on the right. And I'd always say to him, look, we, we, we really would, could do with Ellicraft. And he said, well, you know, yes, one day, but there's not the margin. They're not the margin there. Anyway, I eventually pinned him down about 15 years ago. And I said, look, Eric. And he said, OK, Peter, yeah, look, why don't we do something together? And um, he, he, said, he said, I know you. He said, I know about the company. He said, you don't tell me about yourself. He said, I know, I've seen you at Dayton. and we have a chat every year. So he said, yes. He said, let's give it a go. And um, I think that photograph must have been taken about eight years ago when the KX2 was introduced. And that, was, that, that KX2 was one of the first ones off the production line because they launched it in Dayton. And Eric's on the right there. And on the left is Wayne. Um, who is the sort of co-founder of, uh, of Ellicraft, Wayne and Eric. And that's me with the um, KX2, which I've still got. One of the first KX2s, I think it was number 003, something like that. Hmm. And is this, I mean, you are still a major dealer of Ellicraft, aren't you? Yes. Um, I mean, Ellicraft, I always regard, I always think Ellicraft is rather the sports car of the, uh, the ham radio business. Um, Technically, it's very good. It, the performance is very good. It's always near the top of the um, concentrates on the inside. So I always say it's like a sports car. It may not look pretty, particularly pretty on the outside, but it's great on the inside. And they've had some very, very good transceivers. But recently, they've had a bit of a problem because they stopped the production of the K3 mm. series, which had been running for about more well, 15 years. Um, the K4 was announced, but that coincided with covid it coincided with serious fires in California, where one of the engineers uh, lost his home. And it's also, as, uh, as a result of COVID, component supplies have been very difficult. So the K4, although it's been produced now in small quantities, it's not at the level where they can supply Europe because it has to go for CE tests. And you can only su submit a product for CE test if it's a production model. And at the moment, that production level is not high enough to submit it for CE testing. So we're still waiting for the K4. Oh, that, and that that, is, that's rather sad, really, because Ellicraft have been hit by supplies and, as I say, the COVID situation and so forth. Yeah. But um, it'll come. Yeah, I, I did wonder, and I'm sure many people watching, I know that we have a lot of uh, members of the club who are very keen on Ellicraft equipment. And um, I, I wonder why the K4 hadn't come out yet. And I'd heard about the fire in one of the production facilities, but I hadn't heard about this, the CE marking and that that's what's prevented them because they haven't been able to get the volume through. Let's hope that that sorts itself out soon. We've just got a few comments. I'm going to try and keep on some, some of the questions and comments for you, if that's all right. Um, he said, uh, John Burkett, uh, sorry, this is Graham G8NWC says, John Burkett and Jack Tweedy G3ZY 
uh, this yeah. way in South Lincolnshire, he said. I think, yeah, because Graham lives in sort of Lincoln area. So, yeah, that was a, they were, a Burkitt's, I remember. Yes, I mean, were, in yes, fact, Burkitt's, Burkitt, yeah. are they still yeah. going, I think? Do, they, do I see uh, them advertise? No, no, they were even older than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Um, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, Graham's actually just said that was from the early 70s. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, Telford Communications. Nigel Gunner said Telford Communications. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and it's, it's rather sad, isn't it, that, that all those companies were able to survive manufacturing. Um, I suppose because we didn't have... ICOM hadn't really got a foot in the market at all then. Um, Yesu had the FT101. Uh, um, and Kenwood were just starting up. But, uh, but those smaller companies were able to supply a lot of the smaller bits. And, and it was Coda, Coda equipment as well. Mm. Um, uh, they, they were making 160 metre transmitter and a separate receiver and so forth. So it, in those days, there were quite a few small companies. They weren't large companies, but they were, they were very active. And you saw them at all the rallies. But so t eventually, though, you became quite a force in this and... Even now, you know, obviously you are a big force. Yeah, well, Peter, yeah, we've, we've yeah, been fine. talking now for just over half an hour and I think I've now got to ask you that question as we're still talking about retailing and the shop. Why did Waters and Stanton move down to Portsmouth? Well, why indeed did we move down to Portsmouth? Well, I'm leaving that for the next video because I try to keep these videos no longer than about 20 minutes. Also, why did I do a couple of videos about spy radios? One of which has got nearly 100,000 views. Yes, 100,000 views. And there's other things as well. I mean, for example, why am I having a secret replica spy radio built for me? Well, <laughs> wait till the sequel of this video, the video number two. In the meantime, thanks for watching uh, these videos and uh, if you want to be kept informed of new videos, then press the subscribe button. Don't forget it's a hobby, so enjoy your ham radio. And with the new restrictions being lifted, I'm sure quite a few will be out and about now operating portable. And talking about portable operation, I've just noticed that we've got the new Alex loop, the new Alex magnetic loop in stock. So um, that's uh, an ideal match for your IC705 or your uh, KX2, KX3, FT818. That's the Alex Loop. Just go onto our website, type in Alex Loop. You'll see it. it's a great antenna. And I'm having one sent up to do a review. So I should have a review on that probably in a week or so's time. Depends on the weather, of course. <laughs> in the meantime, thanks for watching. Take care. Speak soon.